I don't think I'll ever be content with the limitations of a screen. Like, there's just so many things. I just want to, like, just a little bit outside this side over here and a little bit outside that side over there. Like, I think once we have, like, true AR glasses that will just give us an infinite canvas for Uh windows, like, I will be happy. That's when you'll be. be. (laughs) That'll be my happy place. And then yeah. I'll be like, this desk is full. Let's move to the other desk. <laughs> That'll be where the, the clutter doesn't live. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I've like it's converted my parents to... Full desktop to... and more. Metaphor, right? Yeah. I've converted my parents to using ultra wides. My dad uses one and my mom uses two for work. So, <laughs> One on top of the other or side by side? It's side by side. So um, it's like a 180 degree shell. Of monitor. It's pretty wide. It's like, uh, what would it be, like 40-something by 9, uh, 41 by 9, maybe? It's pretty wide. Uh, it's wider than what I have, but um, they're smaller. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I definitely couldn't do, like, a single, like, you know, 27-inch display or 32-inch display or something it would, at a normal aspect ratio. It's definitely not enough to have open for, like, anything, like, work or otherwise. Mm-hmm, definitely. Um, okay, I one think thing we're that's nice. Less... Go for it. Yeah, one thing that's nice about the display that I have because it's basically two twenty-seven inch displays. It can do like picture. I guess you call it picture by picture. So you can have two inputs open at once. So what I'll do is like if I'm playing like a game on my PC, I'll have that in on one screen, and then I'll have like the Mac on the other screen and just, you know, have YouTube or Slack or whatever open. So kind of nice to like be able to split it like that. And yeah, I don't know. Big screens are nice for sure. Definitely. That's the the future we all hoped for when we, when we had those little tiny displays that we were working (laughs) with a long, long time ago. Right. (laughs) Remember when a like 20 inch CRT was just absolutely mind blowing. That was a big TV. (laughs) Yeah, dude. (laughs) It's like, oh, check out my parents' big TV. It's 20, 20 inches. Ah, yeah. the good old times. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, I remember probably the first TV I like I had in my bedroom was, like, barely wide enough. You know, it was, like, a built-in VCR player as well. And mm-hmm. it, like, was barely wide enough to fit a VCR. Mm-hmm. That was about the, the size of the screen. <laughs> I mean, it was, like, tiny, dude. I mean, it's... Or, uh, it, yeah. To give those 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 TVs credit, uh, video games at the time looked best at the smaller mm-hmm. size. <laughs> the, the yeah, larger oh, yeah. they are, the the poorer they are represented, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, smaller yeah. was better back then. Yeah, interesting to see how well, like, how good old video games look on like a CRT, even if it's like big. Like, if you were to compare. I don't think that, well, maybe they made them like 55 inch CRTs, right? Or whatever Mm -hmm. compared to like a 55 inch, like TV of today. It's just due to the way, like the, the electron gun or whatever, the way that it displayed Mm -hmm. things, uh, looks way better. It's just, I think the games were made for that. And so when it's like Mm -hmm. not, you know, it's displayed on a a modern display, it just looks like gross. So absolutely. Like whenever whenever you look at like pixel accurate like uh retro games that are emulated they all look very pixely and they don't look correct because yeah there was a whole amount of effort that went into uh, designing your characters around the electron gun right where like a bright spot would literally bleed into all the surrounding pixels and and appear differently than it would on an lcd which very accurately represents a pixel right uh like a a good old cathode ray tube uh those don't have a horizontal resolution it's just an analog signal um on the and the horizontal direction yeah the vertical direction is very quantized but the the horizontal is just an analog signal so um that can be anything um and it like the developers at the time they use that to their advantage to make things look much better than they would ever look today on our very accurate eight by eight representation of a pixel on a giant uh, flat screen, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. 
So yeah. it's kind of interesting how like that people will you know hunt for like specific CRTs because they like if you're playing retro games. It's like it's a good size and whatever mm. the electron gun was or the like uh, the way that the um, I forget what that layer is the um, the photon layer maybe um, ag- on kind of the front where the electron gun hits like it just displayed things really well and was clear and stuff so there's a market for you know good crts that people will still pay like a ton of money for if they're into like retro stuff or i maybe old like media i don't know if you watch movies on a vcr still that's kind of uh, not maybe the same thing yeah that, that definitely one can games pr- probably sure. be modernized <laughs> yeah the the vcr aspect because i think vcr has like introduced all sorts of other crud on top of the picture that was like like the crts like would do better if it wasn't coming from a vcr um yeah which probably. is sad um yeah. but yeah uh, i i can definitely confirm as someone who has hooked up a nintendo 64 to a 55 inch tv <laughs> i had to fiddle with the controls on the tv to make the picture smaller because mm-hmm. otherwise it was just like too big uh and too too obnoxious uh, so like I, I was really fiddling um, and of course the little dongle that you can buy to transform the signal from something from analog to HDMI uh, it like makes a widescreen out of it and my TV is like this is a widescreen signal I don't know how to make it at like uh, right. the other thing so I was like fiddling three. with the scaling like one percent at a time trying to like shrink it in all directions to like oh. be sensible it was just not fun um, but yeah, yeah uh it's it's the the price we pay for probably like a better perf- not better performance but like uh probably better energy costs right a crt is probably using a whole lot more energy than a modern oh, yeah. lcd um and yeah bigger screen i guess is the other benefit yeah. definitely not the yeah, for sure the the depth savings and space that you're benefiting from right oh, that's oh, definitely oh. not a benefit no no not at all it's not like we had uh, i don't even know like two foot deep or more tvs i mean some were just absolutely chonkers dude yeah i remember one day when i was young my my dad came home and he said like i bought a flat screen tv and we were all excited and it turns out it was a flat screen crt (laughs) Right, so yeah, so the was. front is flat, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> the front was flat, but the back was very much not, and yeah, that was that was the, the state of things. Ah, yeah. good times. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on to our regular programming. Yeah. Hello and welcome once again to episode 125 of Code Completion. We are a group of iOS developers and educators hoping to share what we love most about development, Apple technology, and completing your code. My name is Dimitri, and I'll be your host once again for this episode, and I'm joined today by my fellow completionist, Spencer. Hey there. So this week we have a new Swift pitch uh, that's been pitched on the Swift forums, uh, and that is for a new uh, type, I guess we would call this a type protocol? Uh, I don't know, but it's called yeah. Observation. And it yeah. promises oh. to replace all the all the horrible things. Yeah, so this is really cool because it, it kind of it it talks about like, hey, yeah, we already had this observer like this observer pa- excuse me, this observer pattern in a couple places. We have KVO, we have observable objects, we have uh, or, or yeah, we have KVO and that's limited uh, to object or not Objective C, but uh, like ob- sorry, combines observable object requires combine and combine doesn't exist. Um, on all platforms like you you can't use that in in a vapor app right or anything running on linux or whatever so this is kind of a more i think unified uh form of these observer patterns that we already have but it's like a pure swift implementation um and it looks like the as far as the status goes it says it's awaiting implementation so i don't think it's actually like been written anything that we could try yet but the sort of promise of what it could be is really cool and i think um it's nice because like you've got yeah like you know kvo like uh, kvo is weird using context to me is weird i you know i came around way after that was like a normal thing and i've only used and swift makes it nice it it was way weirder (laughs) and objective yeah and having to have like way, way harder too right you can really shoot yourself in the foot there 
Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and observable objects, cool. But again, like the limitation of using combine uh, isn't really a limitation for most people. But again, in vapor, it would be so. Having something that's kind of all encompassing is really cool, and it looks really nice. Like it's using um, uh, key paths and everything for it, it's it's pretty type safe. Like that, I think was one of the bigger goals. If I can find it. Um, yeah, so it says it has an opportunity to provide a robust, type safe, and performant implementation. So um, I think overall, I'm, I'm kind of very painting in broad strokes here, but uh, it seems like a really cool idea to kind of have just a straight Swift solution that is available anywhere, that Swift is available. Yeah, um, and as we mentioned in the past when we discussed Combine, or Combine as it's still stuck in my head to this day, um, this is using a different pattern than uh, Combine, than KVO, uh, than most other uh, other Swift libraries to the state, um, and it is making heavy use of async await um, and async sequences, oh. um, and that's what's really cool about this, and what I don't think a lot of people realize when async sequences came onto the scene, came into the scene, and that's that you can have a loop that is just awaiting new events off of an async sequence. And that loop, for all intents and purposes, can be infinite um, and can right. be triggered by cancellation to stop. Um, and the really cool thing about that is you can go ahead and start this infinite loop, do the one thing that programming books tell you to never do. Um, <laughs> and because it's using async await, it's not actually hogging all the resources on any particular thread it's just waiting patiently for the next event to come in it's essentially an event loop um and mm -hmm. the really cool thing about this is you can observe pretty much anything and transform these event loops as as if they were just objects that you can work with and transform and map and do filter and do all sorts of things with um and i think that's the best part about um about this uh observable protocol um and what it's doing is it allows you to it allows async await to start having like some actual use uh in everyday regular code sure um and i think that pattern once people get used to it is going to allow us to write really great multi-threaded code uh, because we're going to be able to make use of these event streams for things from the network for instance if you're just like listening to a websocket uh, that might be just sending you, pushing notifications to you, then you can react to them in the exact same way, whether it's on that computer or locally on this one. Um, and I think that's the best part about it. Uh, the other really cool thing about it is it's using macros to get the implementation yeah. done. So instead of you needing to say, oh, uh, uh, what, what were the ones for KVO? A uh, view will change and view did, or object will uh, change and object did change Ob or something. Yeah. Value, value something will like that. change, value, value did change. Eventually I'm gonna get it. Um, and uh, all of that can can basically go away in favor of not the compiler, but a macro intelligently identifying all of your properties and just like putting them in for you. And I yeah. think that is really, really cool. It's also making use of some of the cool parts of KVO where you can set up like dependencies between uh, mm -hmm. uh stored properties and computed ones um and it will just take care of the rest for you um and i think that's really cool um and at the end of the day this kind of ends with hey what can this look like for something like swift ui well all of a sudden combine goes out the door you no longer have to mark <laughs> things with published yeah. if you just have yeah. something that's observable then you can just go ahead and observe it uh, in all sorts of different uh, views and stuff like that. So it really ties up all the loose ends um, that are that's kind of got introduced by SwiftUI. SwiftUI was like a big arbitrator of change. Uh, it's a Swift language. It's bringing the yeah. the DSLs in. It's bringing um, <laughs> like async await is probably uh, partly due to SwiftUI coming on the scene and making a mess of things. So. Um, it's it's really good to see a lot of this stuff get cleaned up, um, finally, uh, and I'm really looking forward to being able to use stuff like this because, for all intents and purposes, this is backwards deployable, right? It's not tied yeah. to the latest version of the OS, um, and that is great news for anyone that's really playing around with this stuff. Yep, 
definitely. I was just looking to see how long this this um, uh, this pitch has been around. Uh, it was made it's four days ago. So, uh, yeah. But the the initial yeah. ones were like months ago. It started. Oh, was it? oh oh. You're right. There's an initial pitch. I'm sorry. December of 2022. Okay, that's better. I was gonna say if it was just four days ago, then we're probably not gonna see any progress in a, in a while. But you know, okay, it's been around for four months. Someone's probably working on an implementation. So. Uh, Swift 6, maybe? I don't know. Or potentially much sooner, right? Um, the whole process for anyone who's curious, if you want a feature to come to the Swift language or the Swift standard library, the first thing to do is make a pitch on the forums. It's low F It's designed to be initially low effort, so that way you can gauge like interest. interest um, and yeah. more importantly, gauge interest from the core team uh, to say like, uh, more more or less you're waiting you you don't want them to say no this is a bad idea we're not going to do it right now um but if you get a lot of support from the community they're probably not going to say that and they're going to give you more constructive feedback and said like hey this can't happen like this or we should make use of these new emerging patterns like that um and this is what this pitch went through it went through three individual this might be four four individual rev revisions uh, to get to this point where it's using async await, it wasn't in the initial ones. Um, yeah. And after this point, it's going to become a proper markdown document in the Swift Evolutions uh, repo as a proper proposal. Um, and that's when it has a real review period where um, the core team and uh, I don't want to say investors, but people who are invested in the process uh, can go ahead and comment and uh, share your like anyone can go and share your thoughts on what's good about the proposal what's bad what should we be careful about and assuming you have something good to say it will be it will be uh kept in mind and the next iteration of that proposal will uh will will make changes according to the feedback um and then it's down to getting an implementation and uh if it's important enough to the community, then it will get an implementation by the core yeah. team, right? Um, but if it's something that it doesn't necessarily need to happen now, you might need to like start the work there. Uh, but if you do start the work there, you can probably get more and more people helping out um, because people are invest like interested in ha seeing the yeah. language improve outside of Apple's hands, right? This is a large code base maintained by Apple that you can participate in, which is, is pretty cool. Um, not saying that like work for free and all that. Uh, definitely, definitely gauge, gauge your own time accordingly um, and like use your free time judiciously. But if this is something that you do want to partake in, um, it's, it's a great use of uh, spare time, right? Yeah, it's definitely an open source source project worth contributing to because, yeah, it's like the most immediately and widely benefit benefitable uh, thing that you could work on. Probably you're using Swift all the time in in you know Cocoa Land, so uh, hopefully hopefully you're not using Objective C still all the time. Uh, yeah, yeah, and if you're looking for work, um, then it's a great thing that you can go ahead and put on your resume saying like, hey, I contributed to this piece of the swift language um and if you're if you're being hired for something swift related uh there's a chance that the interviewer may have uh heard of this thing called swift and the process called swift evolution um and that's something that they can go ahead and look at and gauge your skills from so that's always mm -hmm. uh pretty neat yep um you know what the fdc is looking at uh things that are not neat <laughs> yeah definitely not neat uh, the FTC uh, finalized an order requiring Fortnite uh, maker Epic Games to pay $245 million eh, uh, for tricking users. Yeah, yeah, well, for Epic Games, probably. Uh, for tricking users into making unwanted charges. So this whole thing kind of goes into, if you've been following this a little bit, you, you have heard about probably multiple times about um, in Fortnite using just the UI using dark patterns to sort of 
essentially lead uh, kids mostly uh, to, you know, grab the parents' credit card and assume that they want to, um, they, they need to buy something. So I actually, for the first time in my life, installed Fortnite because my I'm working, I'm trying to kind of improve my sister's computer and she plays Fortnite. Fortnite was a, a key piece of that. <laughs> well, yeah, she, and her GPU is kind of old. And so I have one here, but it's the, the, uh, the new Intel GPUs. And so I was like, I don't know if compatibility is like going to be great with this Intel dedicated GPU. So I installed it on my computer to see how it would run didn't work in DirectX 12 that was a whole thing but I got it to launch and everything and like immediately before I even see the main menu it's like hey join the Fortnite battle pass and the, hey do you want these skins and I was like two or maybe three things of like buy this buy this buy this and at the very very bottom it was like you know skip or whatever it, and that's probably after they've fixed a lot of these dark patterns because they've been in this uh, thing with the FTC for a while I think so I definitely see uh, where they're coming from. And it's just, I mean, children's brains are just wired to, uh, they're adaptable, right? And so if they're like, oh, this is what I need to do to play the game or whatever, they're going to be like, oh, I need to do this. And then that becomes sort of this long-seated thing in their brains forever. And that uh, could have more long-lasting effects. So, uh, And it's mostly just like a dopamine a- rush. Right. Uh, yeah. And correct me well, if I'm yeah. wrong. No, that's but my... correct, correct me if I'm wrong. But like, I remember as a kid, and I don't watch TV and I don't know what ads are anymore because I paid to remove all of them. Uh, but as a kid, you'd watch cartoons. Um, I'd like to say Saturday morning, but I watch cartoons every morning. Um, and <laughs> part of the process of watching cartoons is watching lots of ads. Uh, dial 1 yeah. 800 to get this cool, uh, this, uh, cool uh, magic paint thing where you, you have the the thing and you like scrape and it's like the thing or these pogo sticks that ra- launch you to the moon or whatever <laughs> you know yeah, it's like yeah, all yeah, the yeah. dangerous things as seen on tv um uh, before like, yes probably the fcc caught wind of like let's not make things dangerous but as a kid you see all of these things and I don't know about you, but what I did was like, oh, I just have to dial 1-800 and I can get this thing. So I dialed 1-800, got shy, immediately passed it to my mom. uh, And (laughs) of course, like, let her deal with that, those repercussions. But like, isn't that the same thing? Right? Like at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's bombarding children's minds with cool stuff that they want in that moment, right? They don't really care. But if they can get it in that moment and it's really easy to get, namely because credit cards are already saved or Mm -hmm. uh, all you have to do is fish one out of your parents' credit. Like there wasn't credit cards like easily uh, had back in back in the day. Right. You had to you had to judiciously use those things. Nowadays, you use them for everything. Right. Um, And it's just readily available. You might even have the number memorized, um, which uh, is a dangerous thing in and of itself. Um, and yeah, this is exactly the same situation. It's just, instead of the morning cartoons, it's playing a game with your friends and it's interrupted constantly by all this cool stuff that you could have that might be really easy to get. Right. Um, and of course Epic Games is taking advantage of that because why wouldn't they? They're the company that wants to own their own app store. Um, and They would have gone away with it if it weren't for those troubling apples. Um, But (laughs) yeah, this is the the world we live in. It is indeed. Yeah, I think the barrier to entry of getting something is a little bit easier um, nowadays than it was. Like, like you said, like you know, you have to call, you have to get your parents' credit card, and back then, and that was like kind of not really a thing you did. So, I think it's a little easier to sort of end up spending the money i mean you hear uh the stories of like i think it happened even jack black where like his kid bought like three thousand dollars of in-app purchases on a game on his phone or something it's like the barrier to entry is so low uh for that especially if they save the payment information and stuff so i think it's similar but not quite the same to how it was back in the day because like Mm -hmm. i don't know 
or maybe my parents just drilled it into my head to like never buy that stuff or like never i don't know you know that stuff well, at a certain point tv or whatever at a certain point you get like so sick of it um so you, it's it is possible to grow out and maybe it's only possible to grow out of if you're inundated with it uh in your childhood um and then you have a deep hatred sure. for for advertising in general uh to the point where yeah. like a car will try to do it and you you hate you hate their guts for that process right <laughs> um Ooh. uh so like and i'm talking about bmw here uh because BMW yeah, is stupid go. to charge like subscriptions for i don't know carplay and uh seed uh, like heated, heated seats. seats like yeah come on you're already charging 60 grand for the vehicle like come on oh um God. anyways it's uh yeah. the the hulu of automakers right here yeah. um but yeah i'm i'm glad epic games is getting slapped on the wrist um Heck this yeah. feels definitely like a slap on the wrist but maybe after all the litigation they've been through with apple uh their wrist is getting a uh, very sore i don't know i'm sure fortnite's just making just absolutely stupid amounts of money still it's you know it's so popular it's insane Mm -hmm. well the ftc is not giving up uh because they are also banning spam texts which seem to have gotten really really prevalent in the past like two months i've gotten so many like i don't have any more on my phone to read out on air uh but i've gotten so many that all are along the lines of Hey, your Netflix, your Amazon account is uh, no good. Uh, click this link, uh, Amazon.com-somethinghomeuser.us um, to to like re-enable it. Um, and yeah. it's like so obvious, but of course it's not obvious to everyone. It's obvious to us exactly because we're used to it. But it's not obvious to everyone, and you might think, oh shoot, like I need that Amazon thing to continue working. I'm gonna tap this link um and it's it's really sad that we're at this point like there was a there was a time when uh we were all outraged by telecoms listening into every phone conversation reading every text (laughs) sure like at this point i'm wondering shouldn't they be reading all those texts to like block all the spam because it it there's a pattern like i've identified the pattern coming to me from very random numbers imagine how many millions of messages like one marketer is kind of sending out right um so yeah it's it's good that this is gonna start being like the on the telecom companies to start banning these but i don't know what difference that's gonna make yeah i agree i've definitely got a ton more there's an interesting metric in here that says that uh, these text message scams have risen by 500% between uh, 2015 and 2022. Oof. That's a lot. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, the what you know what you do now is you just say you swipe left on the message and say delete and report junk and stuff. But I don't really know what that does or anything. But hopefully, the onus is on someone else that is actually going to do something now. So. That's good. Uh, we'll see if it actually happens. Although I do get um, spam calls fairly often still. So I don't know if this is a part of that. I don't think so. I, I get so many spam calls, not to my personal number, but to my work line that I have as a separate SIM oh. on my phone. Uh, and they are all, uh, do you want landscaping and solar roof? Like I get seven of those a day. Uh, and they all leave voicemails, and it's all the same thing. Oh. And it's like, oh my goodness! Uh, I Gonna fill up your I, inbox. Well, like I don't even know if it fills up. I used to like have some some voicemails that I cherished that I kind of left on on there. Like those have long since rolled off of the hypothetical like inbox if if it still exists and it's still limited by kilobytes or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's just never stopping um and to that point i i have permanently turned on the silence on unknown callers on my phone uh and my voicemail just tells you please text me like what are you doing leaving a voicemail just text me yeah um (laughs) and and none of the landscape people text me so that's how i know it's spam uh but yeah 
I don't know if if you need a voicemail message, feel free to just tell them to text you because what are they calling you from? It's not going to be a landline. They're calling you from a cell phone. They can just text the same number and then you'll be able to read it instantly rather than wait for the voicemail to like get recorded and then process and then eventually tell you that there's a voicemail. You can just text them. It's faster. Don't leave voicemails. Yeah. Uh, but also Apple, please add an option to bl- block like silence unknown callers per phone line because one phone line is tarnished. That would the be other good. phone line is good. Um, so that would be very, very, very welcome. In other news, uh, Apple has a secret new app that they don't want anyone to know about, but it's too late because 9 to 5 Mac has found out, uh, and it's called the Accessory Developer Assistant, um, and it's there to assist. Yeah, so it says that the app is meant to uh, for accessory makers looking to test and verify that their new products work as intended with Apple devices. So, uh you may be asking, what does an accessory count as? Well, uh, it says that it has testing options for things like camera hardware, NFC, I'd assume tags or whatever, um, battery management, case compatibility, and more. So not like, my first initial thought was like, oh, is this accessory like a reality, you know, uh, like AR thing? And we'll get to that. But uh, it seems a little bit more mundane than that. It's just, you know, uh, MFI type stuff it seems like um so yeah interesting though it does mention that so apple ha- in the app store there's like the ability to sort of have unlisted apps and that's mm-hmm. what this is um but it also has it mentions that apple has a couple other unlisted apps like car key and gym kit uh which i thought was interesting and i had not heard of before so that was kind of cool yeah it's basically a bunch of apps that are useful to someone but you don't want them showing up in app store search results. Yeah. Uh, you just want to be able to link them to it. Um, and uh, this is kind of what we have been harking on Apple to do since the dawn of time to resolve the antitrust stuff regarding yeah. the app store. Is like, hey, let people link directly to it. And in that case, sorry, Apple, you can't collect 30%. They are, they are the ones doing the marketing. Right. Uh, but Apple's pivoting that idea to one of uh, secrecy and uh, anonymity, uh, even though those have nothing to do with it, because it's just a link that you can find on 9 to 5 Mac to get direct access to it. <laughs> and per Apple, you cannot change this link because it's the ID of the app. Um, so if you want to change it, you need a new app ID. Uh, and tough luck, Apple, you need to go right through app review and prove your point again. That needs to be an unlisted wow. app, which is uh, quite quite the burden, uh, honestly speaking, Indeed. from experience. Um, so, yeah, uh, keep that in mind uh, when, when all this is coming back into the news uh, cycle, uh, because eventually it is going to come back into the news cycle. It's just a matter of time. And something else that's coming into the news cycle quite a lot recently is reality os uh apple's os for reality yeah kind of interesting i think the best part of this is like so it's it mentions that open source code sort of uh mentions the name reality os and as well reality simulator which is just like such a funny con like (laughs) id name for a concept of like it's a simulator for you know another device, but I just think reality. Simulator Don't they also so have funny. Reality Composer, which is yes, like an I, oh yes, app that you can so. download. It's, it's oh yeah, for, they uh, do. That already exists. Yeah, that already exists. It's it's to make yeah, for uh, iPad. AR yeah AR uh, gizmos um, like the ones that yeah. you see whenever Apple has an event uh, that for whatever reason you cannot view on desktop Safari, but you can totally view on iPad uh, with or without the camera. So. Uh, that's a thing. Um, but yeah, uh, the open source leaks is basically like if defs. You're not going to get any juicy information by uh, digging through Apple's open source stuff. It's basically like, yeah. hey, if this is going to work on this reality thing, we need to turn it off. So they got turned off. It's not including new stuff that's specific to it um, or almost certainly not. Uh, there are some cases where that stuff slips, but it's usually in like Xcode betas, not in open source um so do keep that in mind um but we didn't just get open source leaks we got a hardware leak for the first time 
we can see what the ribbon cable looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah, very just like the most mundane like piece of this entire hardware aside from maybe the strap. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a couple ribbon cables. And I think the fun thing is, let's see if I can find it in this article. Um, in 9 to 5 Max take at the bottom, it says... Uh, a Twitter user also points out that there are some similarities between one of the parts shown in these images and the microphone array used in the HomePod. Uh, so it could just be that, it, you know, Apple is sharing parts or whoever posted this just like got their wires crossed. So it uh, could just actually be a complete nothing burger. And that's the best part. Uh, so, yeah, uh, one of the articles does mention that the expected launch price for their the first generation of these uh, headsets is going to be three thousand uh, dollars which at that price will probably i will probably pass on and it says that they'll try to release a more affordable quote-unquote version uh, for fifteen hundred dollars which i could probably stomach then but three thousand dollars that's a lot that's more than my car is worth so uh <laughs> not not sure if i can I, i'd do that i don't know i'm cheap when it comes to my car though so you mean yeah. you don't want to strap HomePods to your eyes? I don't know. They, they'd sound pretty good. That's they would, could, but your could, eyes don't don't need sound. I know. <laughs> I was just gonna say that's if where the I could LED array just... is gonna come in. It's already blurry because you're blind. So good enough. <laughs> I just need two of the tops of the HomePods, like the series circle things, right there for glasses or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll figure out how to make this HomePod hardware work for for uh, your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. How hard could it be? <laughs> it just needs uh, two woofers and seven tweeters, right? That's right. So uh, I guess the analog would be you want some green and maybe a little red and blue, uh, and you're good, right? That's all. Yeah. That's all that's necessary. That's all it is. Yeah. Just a little red, green, and blue. Yep. I had a quite of quite an experience over the past day, uh, and this all started yesterday when uh, I had the brilliant idea to start organizing this room, the chaos that is my office. Uh, and I decided by uh, starting that process uh, to to clean up all the wiring behind a shelf that's to my right. Um, that I'm not going to bother rotating a computer to show you, uh, but. Uh, on this shelf is a bunch of networking equipment, and then at the bottom uh, there are uh, Mac Mini connected to like a few Thunder Bays, uh, which have a bunch of hard drives, and I use that as like the the home file server. Um, I recently got another UPS, uh, uninterruptible power supply, uh, for the networking equipment, and in order to install it, I need to basically redo all the cabling because it was a yeah it was a spidery mess back there um so this shelf became very heavy as a result of all the stuff that's on it so i carefully moved the shelf i carefully snuck behind it i carefully uh rewired and uh zip tied everything to perfection um and at that point i remembered hey this mac mini is the first m1 mac mini and it does not have 10 gigabit ethernet I originally got a uh, OWC 10 gigabit ethernet thing, but that was really buggy, daisy chained off of yeah. other Thunderbolt stuff. So I stopped using it. Um, and in the years in between, I had actually gotten another Mac mini to do like a separate project with, and I got 10 gigabit ethernet for that one, but I never actually did that project. So it was just sitting there kind of unopened. Um, so I was like, well, now's the time to do it since I basically am rewiring everything anyways. Uh, so I went through uh, the process of trying to like transfer everything from Mac Mini A to Mac Mini B. Basically the same specs, the only difference is Mac Mini B had 10 gigabit ethernet, which would benefit um, everything on the network because like the access to the hard drives is actually faster than gigabit. Um, so, uh, in order to do that, uh, Migration Assistant is uh, portrayed as the best thing since sliced bread um, to kind of migrate something and never, nothing ever goes wrong when you use it. Um, and I've heard that time and time again. So I'm like, yeah, do you know what? I'll go ahead and trust it. 
I may have spent way too much time like setting up soft raid uh, and doing <laughs> carbon copy cloner uh, and figuring out the various permission spaghetti uh, so that way uh, my good friend Spencer can access uh, these hard drives yeah. so that way we can collaborate on this little project we have called code completion um, and have like a shared storage space. Uh, so like I had already torn my hair out many times in the past uh, to kind of get that set up and it was finally like working well. Uh, and of course yeah. now is the time I decide, well, I want it to work better than well. I want <laughs> some faster speeds connecting to this thing. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to like throw it all out the window. Uh, so, uh, I am now presenting the good, the bad, and the interesting of migration assistant because, oh boy, do I have thoughts. First of all, all right. um, uh, migration assistant, it kind of works excellent if you have laptops because laptops have this very convenient thing called a screen, a keyboard, and a trackpad attached to them. Um, and you just kind of connect the two of them up, use a Thunderbolt, uh, cable, a Thunderbolt cable will make everything much faster and much mm -hmm. better. Um, and recently, as I found out, Thunderbolt cables will network 20 gigabit per second between computers instead of 10, which they were stuck at for the longest time. So that's really, really cool. Mm. Um, so grab a Thunderbolt cable and connect them up. However, uh, because these are both Mac minis, neither of them has a monitor, neither of them has a keyboard and mouse, uh, which is problematic because I don't, yes, I have a lot of monitors in this room, but they're not like necessarily ready to just yank yeah. out of their position or like find a long enough Thunderbolt cable to connect them to a computer. Uh, so thankfully I had a very ancient uh, 1080p uh, like laptop, not laptop, uh, computer monitor from the stone ages uh, that I was able to connect up to this thing. Uh, it's funny because you turn it on and like the black is so bright. <laughs> it's just like yeah. the the <laughs> back like, like going through the black is like bright enough to light up a room. Uh, it's it's that era of of computer sure. monitors. Uh, definitely under seventeen inches. Um, maybe like fourteen inches. I would say fourteen inches. <laughs> um, needed a dongle to get HDMI because the back yeah, of it, it was like ain't DVI. HDMI. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it is, it is DVI. Or VGA. Uh, but yeah, DVI, not VGA. Uh, yeah. that would have yeah. been extra sad. Uh, this is widescreen, <laughs> sir. Um. Oh, I apologize. So, yeah, it has a dongle for, for DVI to HDMI, which is just, like, permanently attached to it. Because what else would use DVI in this household? Um. Yeah. And, yeah, so I brought that down from the shelf. I plugged it into, uh, the new Mac Mini. Because the old Mac Mini, I'm like, okay, this one is already networked. I already have screen sharing. I can have it up on this iMac that I'm talking to you from now. From, yeah, right now. Uh, and this iMac also has a keyboard and a mouse. Um, and thankfully, uh, modern Apple, like, Bluetooth devices, you can plug them in and that will s immediately switch the pairing. Yeah. So that's, like, the right. best case scenario for this kind of stuff. So I grab a good old lightning cable. I connect it to that new that new mac mini and i uh bring my keyboard down and i plug it in and i'm like great it's plugged in and i immediately like realize that problems are going to start arising because i needed to go back to the imac to do something on the old mac mini namely type in a password i'm like <laughs> keyboard where did the keyboard go <laughs> so then oh, i no. grab the keyboard back and replugged it into the imac and type the password unplug the keyboard put it back down there uh, and went back and forth from the floor to this desk um, numerous times. Okay, so that's like problems number one. Uh, problems number two, uh, you get to the point where you get to the migration assistant step and it's like, oh, searching for other computers. And then you're like, oh yeah, I need to go to the other computer and turn on migration assistant. So you go the, ahead and yeah. do that. So I, I hop back to the iMac via screen sharing to the old Mac Mini. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do migration assistant. As soon as I start that process, it like logs me out of the screen sharing and it has like a, yeah. a new special user called login user, um, oh. which was surprising. Uh, and you cannot log into that one via screen sharing. So I'm like, the screen sharing is not working. So I am now permanently on the floor connecting HDMI <laughs> between computers <laughs> along with the USB cable that's connected to the keyboard to instantly pair it uh, between computers. Uh, and thankfully these two Mac minis have two Thunderbolt ports because my my 
cable to lightning is a USB-C one, and there's only one left because the Thunderbolt's going between the other two. So long story short, I'm going, I'm going between the two. I finally get to the point where I can start the migration assistant, and then it tells me you can't do migration assistant because this Mac Mini is running an older version of the OS. I'm like, Correct. didn't we solve this already? Like, don't the phones like update? Like, I was hoping for that, but apparently uh, things were too old. Uh, so I had to back out of the migration assistant <laughs> oh, stuff, man. set up the computer from scratch. Do not put an Apple ID in at this point, because otherwise you're going to tie the computer to an Apple ID, and that's going to make you racing it a pain in the butt. Uh, so skip yeah. that part. Get to a desktop as fast as you can. Put bogus for everything, uh, and then run software update. So I ran software update. That took a hot moment. Um, I, I was blessed with the fact that I have Ubiquity gear that can tell you how fast things are downloading at, uh, and they were definitely not saturating any sort of internet that I pay for, uh, which was wonderful. <laughs> I don't know whether to blame uh, Spectrum, because Spectrum sucks. I don't like Spectrum. Uh, they cut my internet out 17 times a day, and I have proof of that now, because Ubiquity tracks that. Um, nice. And I notice all the time, because YouTube just stops working out of nowhere until I go back onto 5G. And 5GE to the rescue, because that one always works for whatever reason. Uh, just not on the Apple TV. Anyways, uh, back to the migration assistant. I am losing <laughs> track of reality. So, get Ventura downloaded. Get Ventura installed. Uh, that is all working fine. Uh, it gets to the point where everything is looking great. Uh, then I need to wipe it. So, of course, I need to open settings. And I know that they added wiping and like erase everything. Uh, but of course, like, I don't know where to find it in settings, but thankfully yeah. the search knew where to find <laughs> it. Uh, and I'm going to get back, get back to settings because, oh boy, do I have thoughts on settings. Um, so you can erase everything now. It's like the perfect. I don't have to go to disk utility or nothing. So erase stuff, uh, seems to be happy with that. At a certain point, it felt like it did something weird where I had to like log into the recovery thing to say I really wanted to erase or to reactivate it. Like it was very bizarre. Uh, but it got reactivated and like the whole process started anew as if it's a brand new computer on Ventura. I'm happy ish uh, by this point. So now back to the migration assistant, the other computer was still waiting. So I'm like, okay, I'll just, like, that one's ready. This one, I need to do migration assistant, click on the thing. It doesn't complain about the version anymore. And I say, go, and it goes back and forth back and forth and i'm like yeah it's probably gonna take a few hours uh so i leave come back it's still going back and forth back and forth. oh my and guess God. what i needed to go on the other computer and start the process but oh. i didn't know that because i don't have a monitor connected to the other computer to like know what it's waiting for me and i didn't want to read one yeah. line so yes shame on me of course but uh there i go disconnect the hdmi plug it into the other one and on the other one it's like hey what do you want to transfer like i'm just waiting um so i've like okay i go through that freaking um, everything I, dude I, I i i try to move the mouse and the mouse is not working oh i need to unplug the lightning plug it into the mouse okay the mouse is working now uh go ahead make sure everything is good there click continue uh go back to the other one it says hey do you want to start the migration i'm like yes yes please uh start the migration here are some numbers go ahead and verify on the other computer and click continue so I go to the other computer, I check the numbers, and I'm like, okay, the numbers are okay, I go back to the new computer, and I'm like, I can't click continue, it's grayed out. Oh, continue on the other one. So I unplug the HDMI back to the old one. <laughs> I, I have gone, oh I remember Dude. how many times I went back and forth. That was how infuriating it was. Um, so I get to the point where things, things, are, things are finally making progress. Um, I, I can start, start migrating stuff. Um, I don't remember if it was now or afterwards that I was deeply impressed by stuff. Uh, but it, at one point asked me, Hey, enter the password for the administrator, uh, that's going to be on this computer. And that was like my user. Uh, so I did that one. And there's one other user that's lens. Uh, that one's not an administrator account. And then there's one sharing only user. That one didn't even show up. Okay. We'll get back to that one. Uh, that's the one that Spencer uses to log in. Um, so uh, that one uh, didn't even show up in the UI, but Linz basically showed a prompt that said, hey, uh, this account is going to get a temporary password and you're going to need to reset it. 
So I'm like, okay. Oh. I take a picture of it with my phone. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, then I click OK and it says, hey, don't forget this password. So I'm like, okay, it's important. Apparently it's a bunch of gobbledygook. Um, but my phone has a picture. I'm reasonably sure uh, that it's that it's going to be saved. Um, and we can go ahead and start uh, doing the process. So I click go and it starts going. The, the computer starts going burr. Um, and at this point, I'm very happy that Thunderbolt exists because not only did it surpass gigabit, it got up to five gigabit something, 630 yeah. megabytes per second of small That's files it. transferring between computers. Like just copying Xcode, you know that you're n- rarely going to get 630 megabytes per second. And Xcode was one of the things that was being transferred. So I was very happy for the amount of time it took to transfer everything from computer A to computer B. Um, that was very cool. Uh, another thing that was very cool, because this is the last thing that was very cool, um, is that I knew that SoftRaid is going to throw a hissy fit if I try to activate the same license on both computers. So before I did any of this, I went to SoftRaid. I did the about, and I was like, I'm going to copy the serial number because I don't know where to find it. Um, and of course you can't copy that, but I'm like, Mac OS is magical. Now I took a picture, yes. a screenshot, uh, to the clipboard directly. I opened preview. I said, command N all this via screen sharing, by the way. Um, I, uh, did command N It opened a new window in preview on that computer. And lo and behold, you can select text right in preview that is from a screenshot. And that is pure magic. Um, and then I let the migration happen. And once the migration is done, that preview window just popped on open and I was able to copy and paste that so well. Um, I was very happy about that. Uh, so if you need, if you need hard to get serial numbers, just take screenshots and leave them open before you start migrating. Um, or I guess do your time machine backup. I don't know if any of this would have been different with the time machine backup. Uh, but this is when it starts to get worse and worse. So, um, I mentioned uh, that uh, Lynn's account had this weird gobbledygook password. Uh, so the only way to u- make use of that gobbledygook password is I needed to uh, log out and then log back in with her account, uh, at which point typing the gobbledygook password, it prompts you to reset the password. So right. that was fairly good. I didn't have to deal with keychain access being completely broken uh, whenever you reset passwords uh, external to the account. So that was really nice. Um I foresaw that the sharing only uh, account at this point uh, probably did not get migrated correctly um, and did not have the same password that it had before. uh, And lo and behold, it didn't. However, that was easy enough to reset. Um, Thankfully, I had the hunch to do that before I tore my hair out even further. However, um, I did get a chance to tear tear my hair out even further uh, because uh, file sharing got completely broken in the process uh because of course why wouldn't it um yeah it's not like you want to migrate like assistance migrating the entire computer or anything that's not sharing is not part of that no so i opened file sharing preferences uh or settings uh and well first i have to find the damn thing uh and now i know where it is <laughs> it's located in settings general sh- like sharing and then in there you have the sharing stuff um that's where sharing is located and the list of shared drives was just empty uh so that was wonderful i go onto the old computer and that one has like half icons because the external hard drive is not plugged into it anymore so i'm like okay this is a nightmare and a half as is carbon copy cloner a plus knew exactly what to do is like hey your startup disk is different do you still want these tasks to run and i'm like yeah yes please and it just like was on its way, was able to back up from dry, yeah. like big hard drive A to big hard drive B uh, within an hour and was happy. Uh, so good job. Good job, Carbon Copy Cloner. Uh, SoftRaid, to their yeah. credit, also more or less great experience. Um, needed to restart like seven times um, to do the the enhanced Extension stuff. security and all that. Um, yeah. And then, like, every time I launched it, it was like, yeah, we did it. Uh, But, like, it didn't do it. And I restarted. I was like, yeah, you should do it. Uh, And I, like, I don't know. There was an option to, like, reinstall the driver. I reinstalled the driver. I was happy from that point forward. Uh, So really no complaints there. That was 
uh, relatively painless uh, compared to still not having file sharing. Uh, so yeah, I don't know how to get file sharing working. It seems to work for about five minutes when I turn it on uh, and then it just will stop after that. So I'm still looking into that uh, and I will update yep. everyone next week uh, with uh, more anger. Um, but what else? What else uh, went horribly wrong? Oh, yes, uh, content cache. So there is a uh, a sharing option called content cache. What's it called, content cache? I don't know. Let me check now uh, because I stared at a lot of things. Uh, if you want to know where sharing is, it's under general yeah, sharing. Yeah, content caching. Um, because that's where we go. Uh, content caching. Yeah, so content caching is something I had on my old uh, system. Uh, and it was set up to save up to eight terabytes of Apple gobbledygook, uh, which includes oh. iCloud data, which is super cool. Um, which means I don't need to rely on my crappy internet provider spectrum uh, to have syncing between devices. It will just go through the content caching server that's on the local network. Um, so I don't want that on the actual disk, uh, the internal disk of the Mac mini, but I do want it to make use of the hundred or so terabytes I have available uh, to go yeah. ahead and like, hey, use eight, eight terabytes of that. Have, like, have fun. Uh, go ahead and put it there. Um, and yeah, that just stopped working. Um, and like nothing I did would like convince it to be okay with the hard drive. Uh, and that's because, uh, problem number 17 of this list is that if you have an external drive and you have permissions turned on on it, which by the way, everyone tells you, you should probably just ignore permissions on external drives for a good reason. It's a pain to deal with but you need it if you want to do file sharing to parts of that drive and not the whole drive, which is right. a problem. So since this drive is like integral to the computer itself, it's like a NAS for all intents and purposes, I do want permissions on it. But those permissions dun, 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 are not transferable between computers because of course not. Yay. Why wouldn't they be? Um, so yeah, uh, I think for the most part, they're not transferable because it was set up pre-Ventura. So a lot of the IDs for the system oh. groups did not translate over. The IDs for the user groups did. Um, and uh, for a little background here, Unix stores uh, users and groups as like actual integers. Um, I don't even know if they go above 1,024, but <laughs> it's like they start off at 500 uh, for user like regular users. Um, yeah, I don't know what the deal is there, but that actually gets saved in the file metadata as that number. So on whatever new computer you plug this thing into, it's just going to interpret that number as a user on that system, which right. is not going to be great. I think yeah. the, ac the ACLs, the access control layer, I don't know what that stands for, but I made up access control layer. Um, those, I think, use strings, which is a little bit more robust. Um, and I think that's where everything went wrong because sharing pre Ventura, like back in the 10.11 days or whenever the M1 came out, whatever OS that was, uh, every time you yeah. set up a sharing thing, it made a new like physical group for the share that you made. And that apparently is not compatible. So maybe that's why my file sharing is not working. I don't know. But I had to manually clean up a bunch of ACLs and I got very intimate with the change mod uh, command. And I now know how ACLs <laughs> work. And I'm very proud of myself, Big Spencer. I solved that's a longstanding good. problem with our file share. If you create a folder, I can now access it. And if I create a folder, you can now access oh. it because it will inherit permissions. Yay. Woo! Um, so once file sharing works, that will be awesome. Uh, but until then... Uh, I have, I guess, more ACLs to clean up because I don't know. Um, so yeah, that was problematic. Mm. Um, are you ready for more so, good news? Oh, wait, you have well, a question. Uh, Please ask me I a, have question a question before so, I give you more good news. Yes. So I guess what you're saying though is to verify this result, this like it not working between old versions of Mac OS, what you need to do is you need to reset one of the computers and migrate it again and see if the my, the permissions stay mm -mm. because they're now on mm -mm. Ventura. Mm -mm. <laughs> I think you need to do that just for mm -mm. for for science. Mm -mm. 
<laughs> All right, maybe not. I am never, I am never migrating again, good sir. Um, no, I do it for will science, my friend. <laughs> I don't have time for science. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, I, I am legitimately interested. But I'm sharing my half results with everyone here now because that is my way of uh, dumping fair. out my problems into the world. Um, but yeah, I, one more piece of good news. Uh, sharing. It has this thing called local host name, right? It used to have a thing called computer yep. name and then local host name is like right underneath uh-huh. it and you can go ahead and like clean it up so that way it's not full of Unicode stuff, right? So I'm like, okay, all my computers, they all have like uh, VNC locks, URL locks to uh, the other networked uh, devices and I don't want to redo all that. This computer is replacing the old one so I'm going to give it the same host name as the other one, the right. same dot local. Um, and therefore, Time Machine will just continue to work once I figure out the file sharing. Um, screen sharing will work. That one I did figure out that night. Um, and all sorts of other things, right? Uh, so I make sure, well, first, like it was hard to figure out what the old uh, look, dot local was because. Uh, guess what? It's not easy to just turn on the other computer and have that information be available because then they're going to be stepping on each other, and that's no good. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, I uh, thankfully have screens on my iPad, and that actually has the local inf- the the actual URL that was Close used name. when you used Bonjour the first time, um, and I was able to copy that over to the new one. I was like, great, everything's all set up. I'll just be able to like click on the thing I usually click on on the other computer and I'll just bring up screen sharing and I'll be happy. And I click on that thing and it doesn't bring up screen sharing. It says cannot connect. And I'm like, what's going on? So then I look at the VNC lock and I pull it into a hex editor and I notice that uh, in the binary there, it's not using the local host name. It's using my atrocious uh, hand-tailored emojiified computer name that you now enter in the about screen so there is a house emoji uh, followed by space oh my not gosh. not a regular apostrophe a curly apostrophe because it's hypergraphically wonderful um and all of that so of course it wouldn't match up and of course i would need to figure out what the original because of course it's url encoded so i don't even have the original emoji oh, there yeah so like i am finding i'm trying to look for websites that will just url decode it for me because i am at wit's end at that point uh finally get a thing copy that over to the other one paste it no first time i typed it and it wasn't working that was because i got the apostrophe wrong it was a curly apostrophe not a straight apostrophe mm-hmm. um so once i copy pasted it and then it finally worked uh, and then everything was happy to screen share. And I'm like, I am getting closer. I felt so good at that point. Uh, and everything went downhill once I like banged my head against the sharp corner of the room to figure out the file sharing stuff, uh, which I did not fi- figure out. I figured out the content caching, though, and I am happy to share that solution with you. Uh, if you have a drive uh, and you say that everyone has no permission because you don't want every like sharing user to see the entire hard drive that you're ostensibly trying to share um then it will not work with content caching and that's because content caching requires uh a special user called underscore asset caching or something like that uh to have access to the drive to search for the location of the, the path so it was creating the path all on its own but it couldn't read the path it was very backwards um i'm guessing one process was the one creating and one process was the one like actually trying to read from it um i eventually like figured out how to get console to oh i should stop console console if you leave open running long time on modern mac os will crash modern mac os uh fun fact ask me how i know um but i need to stop that so thanks for the reminder um and and yeah uh you need to add an acl for that and to add an acl because i'm now a master at this you do change mod plus a space quotes underscore access control space allow space search uh and search allows it to like get the path um i ended up just giving it access to everything because i'm like i don't care 
uh, if you add search, then you can go to Finder and use its nice GUI uh, to change the custom role to read and write. Um, and oh. I did that and added a whole bunch of other ACLs, which I then copy pasted to fix our problems. Um, so that's what I did. I let it recreate its library folder and all that. Uh, and I think from this point forward, it's happy. And I can now have like download the system update once and then allow every computer on the network, which that's are all nice. like M1 computers at this point. Um, I guess there's an M2 and then various variations, but I think the system updates are more or less the same. Anyways. Uh, that can all now just like go there and then I can download that to the other computers at 10 gigabit speeds. And I am happy That's with that so because that nice. is wonderful. But I can't do that yet because file sharing is still broken. Actually, Sweet. no, I guess the content sharing caching can happen regardless of file sharing. So who knows? I don't know. You tell me. Maybe it'll work. Uh, I don't know. Well, I'm sure you'll have an update for us, though, in a <laughs> week or so. So that has been my fiasco dealing with Migration Assistant yesterday. Um, I don't have good things to say about Migration Assistant other than it was fast. And if you don't use your computer as a computer and you just use it as an iOS device, it probably works great. Um, if you rely on any part of the fiddly parts uh, of yeah. your computer, uh, it's just not going to work. I don't know why I didn't just copy over the data like part of the disc why didn't it just do that it can do that now right yeah would time machine yep. have been better because time machine would have just done that and would have done a migration th i don't know that's 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 where i am like frustrated yeah i don't have a good answer for you that's good enough for me <laughs> This week's episode of Code Completion is brought to you by Sticky Widgets. Sticky Widgets is the absolute easiest way to put a sticky note on your home screen and edit it quickly. It's so easy, you never need to open the app itself. Add a sticky widget to your home screen through the iOS home screen editor and tap on it to edit. That's about it. Of course, there's tons of customization options as well. Font, color, text size, alignment, all conveniently located in the system's edit widget interface. Add as many sticky widgets as you'd like or put them in a smart stack. Sticky widgets are digital sticky notes for your phone. Use them however you'd like. Sticky widgets is a free download on the App Store and additional font and color options are available for a one-time in-app purchase. Thank you so much to Sticky Widgets for sponsoring Code Completion. Check out Sticky Widgets on the iOS App Store today. So Spencer, I have yes. a Code Completion tip for you. Uh, and that is all about using pattern matching in more places. So we talked about them last week-ish um, in using them for uh, error cases, right? Yes. Um, and we also talked about using them in switch cases. Uh, yes. And it turns out anywhere you see case, that's like a hint that the pattern matching operator will be used. Uh, and there are a few mm. more of these, which are frankly quite useful. Um, the first is like guard case let and if case let. Sure. Um, without the let even, um, those are great w places to go ahead and use um, uh, enum matching because enums don't always conform to equatable. And when they don't conform to equatable, then you can't just check if this enum equals equals dot something, especially once right. you start handling like associated uh, objects and all that. So um, this allows you to do enum matching without doing enum equation um, by using the if case, uh, because you can say if case dot your enum case equals the variable holding the enum. It's a very backwards syntax and i didn't really wrap yeah. my mind around it more so than just memorize it um because life is too short to understand everything um i'm sure there's a good reason uh but i did not figure it out but this can also be used in four statements which is really cool namely if you have an array of optional things you can say something along the lines of four case let my optional question mark in array of optionals and it will only iterate on the things that exist in that in that array like the non-optional cases and that's because optionals are enums uh, and you're just casing on a particular on a particular one so that's that's one situation where they're useful uh, you can also use the pattern matching in for loops 
without the, the case uh, by adding a where clause. So if you have a for loop uh, where you wanted to filter through and you had like a guard at the top of it that would just continue if you were not satisfying some condition um, or worse, an if that had like uh, uh, an ever-growing pyramid of indentation following it, mm -hmm. um, you can go ahead and move that condition to a where clause and that will do the same thing for you um, without needing to ha have an extra line of code for it. So uh, that's right. another great use case for for this. And those where clauses turns out work with um, work with uh, the pattern matching operator. So um, I have linked uh, an article by Swift by Sundell, who, as always, goes into uh, intimate detail of all of these things. Yeah. So definitely do check it out. Um, there's a lot of neat tidbits about the Swift. Uh, syntax that most people are not necessarily super uh, I don't want to say comfortable with but uh, com I guess comfortable with is a is a okay way of putting it but yeah. they're not bad right um, and b becoming comfortable with it will allow you to write cleaner and more succinct code that is not necessarily more confusing it's just it's using parts of the language that uh, everyone should know a little bit more about yeah definitely um, if you too think that if case let syntax is backwards like me and Dimitri, because I also think that, and you also forget, well, I have a website for you brought to you by, I think the same people that brought you gosh darn block and gosh darn closure syntax is gosh darn if case let syntax.com, which goes into, uh, all of the detail that Dimitri just talked about if case let and the where statements and everything. So uh, I've used this before and it is very useful. It's just one page, but it gets into, um, you know, if you're like, oh crap, what is that syntax? Perfect, perfect reference. Um, and, it, on the if on the, website, uh, and if that website is too hard for you to memorize, there is an explicit <laughs> version of that that is much easier to yes. remember. Uh, so uh, commit yes. one of the two to your mind, to your like memories uh because the if case let syntax is going to take a lot more effort to commit to your memory than that one because it's not as funny uh but that one is definitely way funnier uh so link yeah. in the doobly-doo but yeah commit that to memory more than anything because you will never forget it yeah on the topic of the where case so something that i ran into for the first time um maybe a month ago at work is we use um swift lint for just linting purposes and we've changed it to like instead of giving us warnings they're just hard errors so you like have to fix the problem which i think is actually pretty good it's annoying in the moment but good uh in the long run um we've made it so that like for, for like uh i think this happens with happened to me with like a force uh just like a for loop but um i'm sure it would happen for like this four case let where you put the where statement um, it actually gives you an error if you just have a for loop with a single if statement in it and that's it. Uh, it just says use a where statement instead. So um, SwiftLint's really cool. It's just, you know, can help drill into you, <clears throat> whether you like it or not, these kind of better ways of uh, simplifying your code and, you know, ultimately making it a little bit better and more readable. So less indentation and stuff. So it's nice. Yeah. Um, I like Swift Lint when it's not uh, all demanding, right? Because when it starts to insist that, oh, you can't have extra spaces here when your like, handcrafted yeah. indentation would look much better sure. than the automated indentation it insists yeah. on. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's like a hard wall towards you being a creative person that is actually writing text in a document uh, and wanting to be creative with that. If that is getting in your way, I am not a fan of SwiftLint. If it is purely yeah, there to give you warnings and information about the files that you are changing to make sure you don't make any mistakes, A+. Plus. Uh, definitely go ahead and install it on your CI to put warnings so that way they are more noticeable uh, and won't necessarily get forgotten. Um, so yeah. uh, that's thankfully pretty easy to do uh, if you do want to do it, um, to go ahead and set that up on like GitHub. Uh, so definitely look into that. Um, but, uh, yeah, don't force others to like follow your, your same linting rules just because you saw that, um, I don't know, 
uh, Airbnb is doing the same thing and they are the de facto <laughs> yeah. rulers of the, the pattern. Um, like, be creative. You are human. Yeah. Uh, we are few and far between uh, considering the AI overlords are going to replace all of us and write SwiftUI with GPT-4, <laughs> uh, which is an article that I chose not to include in today's uh, episode, Whoa. but you can go ahead and look that up if you really want to. Uh, but we are all being replaced, so let's be human about it, uh, and then it can copy us and have some a very nice indentation that didn't get swift um in yeah. the process. Definitely some moderation needs to happen there, as far as swift Lint goes. On the topic of things that we've already reviewed, um, I have a thing that we've already reviewed for the mini review corner. Yay. And I don't have it in my hands uh, because uh, I have installed it. Uh, and that is uh, the Circle View doorbell, which Spencer reviewed. Um, yes. The thing that I want to review in particular uh, is HomeKit Secure Video because uh, it came in the news yet again uh, that Ring um, is kind of like doing not so great things. So in this particular so case, bad. there was a, a crime that happened on the street uh, and the police asked the person, hey, your Ring doorbell was pointed at the crime. Can we please use the footage? And the guy was like, yes, here you go. Here's the footage of the crime. And then the police later decided, hey, um, we're going to need the whole day's footage, but we're not going to ask you. We're going to ask Amazon. And then Amazon just gave it to them, along with the 20 other cameras, including the inside of their home, which... Including in their bedroom. Yeah, it's like, that is not cool. <laughs> oh, um, so bad, but dude. it gave them a fr the law enforcement a free access to that. Um, and if you're into kinky stuff and you live in Canada, that can basically mean you're going to jail because kinky stuff is not allowed in Canada for some reason. Um, really? and yeah, it's it, like, you don't cross the border with kinky stuff. Uh, if you ever go to Canada, okay. I not, but that's just something I happen to know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> okay. A fun Canadian fact for you. I don't know. <laughs> I, I was trying to search for like things that would not be super incriminating to talk about uh like that you would get in trouble but you also don't want the police knowing like yeah and and i was coming up shorthanded so i landed on kinky yeah. stuff in canada but that's fair. Uh, that's fair uh it, it goes to show that you don't necessarily want these devices that have an especially uh keen eye on how your life operates being shared with others based on uh warrants that are not even being served to you Right. This is was a warrant that was just served to Amazon because they know Amazon just going to give access to it because Amazon yep. is good buddies. Um, so uh, on that note, uh, we have an alternative and it is provided by Apple and it's called HomeKit Secure Video. Uh, and that one is special because no one except you has access to it. Apple does not have access to the content that's being saved in iCloud. Um, and it's just your devices and the devices of people you share your home with, um, your Apple home, uh, which is really weird. Side note, if you add stuff to HomeKit uh, or the Home app, it says, would you like to add it to Apple Home? And it doesn't use the name of the home. Does it do that for you oh. recently? I don't know. Or is my system just broken? I don't know. My system's probably broken. Uh, but uh, it says... Uh, Long story short, you can have a bunch of these cameras, especially if you pay Apple lots of money for the, the fancy iCloud. Um, I think it gets yeah. to a point where it's like unlimited for 10 days, unlimited cameras for 10 days. Um, and yeah. you can basically have the camera record 24-7. I have one that's recording my front street, um, and it will record under any movement, and cars drive by all the time. So it's basically recording the entire day, um, okay. which... Uh, yeah, it's good for when we want to know when the delivery person came by, uh, so that or when the trash people are coming by, so that way we can give them a thank you gift come the holiday season. Um, nice. But yeah, okay, secure video. Um, great, good, good, a good thumbs up for me. I don't know what the other solutions offer to be honest, uh, but. Uh, what I can tell you is that HomeKit Secure Video will go ahead and detect people. It will detect packages, animals. Um, we have them in our home so that way we can track what the cats are doing when we're not home. Um, and so that way we can track where they pee because that one of them has a peeing problem. 
Um, and we just wanted to be able to keep track of that. So we have them on every litter box and we know when they're peeing and then we know when we can give them a treat that they did a good job peeing to fix the peeing problem. Uh, it's a whole thing. <laughs> but <laughs> so, uh, all in all in all, they work really well. Um, we use them via the circle view, uh, Logitech, uh, cameras. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I wanted to give the, the doorbell a try because it's made by the same people. And I thought the doorbell was like this big, like a hunk and piece of uh, like appliance that you attach Plastic. on the outside. <laughs> uh, but it is yeah. really tiny. It's like it's an Apple small. TV size. It's smaller than an Apple TV remote. It's about the remote, yeah. Yeah, I was definitely assuming like uh, a slightly longer iPhone size, like in, mm. in terms of height. That's what it looks like in all of their marketing. And then it comes as like this really teeny tiny thing. Um, so that was that was fun. Um, installing it without a transformer, like they don't have any installation instructions, which is maddening. They just assume, hey, you have a system set up. Um, so I had to piece together Reddit posts to figure out how to uh, install a transformer and have their little chime kit without the yeah. actual chime and all that. But uh, once set up, it works really well. You you press the button, it goes ding dong on every HomePod in the house, which is way better than any one chime can do. Um, if it recognizes the person, it will say Dimitri Buniel is at the front door, uh, which was right. very funny. The f- several times that we were pressing it and it just yelled that across every bathroom in the house, which is <laughs> hilarious. Nice. Um, uh, and yeah, it detects packages. Um, it will detect packages regardless of someone pressing on it, which is nice. Um, it will detect leaves moving if you choose to have it send you notifications of leaves moving. Um, and yeah, uh, I have nothing but good things to say. Oh, uh, a fun bonus fact. If you are watching anime on your TV, because I don't know what else you do on TVs other than watch anime, um, it will go ahead and show you a camera of who is at the door so that way you yeah. can... You can uh, avoid avoid the the person that's at the door if you don't want to deal with them trying to check your dwp invoice to see if you're losing money so that way they can help get you a contractor that will install something that you don't need uh to collect their fees from the rebate <laughs> program i don't know it's a long thing um but yeah a plus home se- home kit secure yeah. video circle view doorbell uh nothing but happy things to say about them so far I don't until summer comes be disgruntled. <laughs> oh yes i forgot okay there's a giant asterisk for everyone to know yes <laughs> um uh, i i uh, okay forgive me for not thinking about this it's been raining in california for the like 10th week in a row yeah um and they're like we are out of a drought for the next four years like that's how much rain we got, and it has not been very much rain, but we are like saving every drop of it for the next four years, apparently. Um, but yeah, we've gotten a lot of rain, so it has not been hot. I live in a place called Sun Valley, so I fully expect this to like go downhill very quickly over the coming days. Uh, but uh, if this thing is facing the sun, apparently it will just shut down because it overheats. So do yep. keep that in mind. Uh, if you have a door that faces the sun during any part of the day, uh, it will probably overheat and shut down. I believe, Spencer, you have experienced this every day, correct? Can confirm. Yep. It doesn't happen every day, but it happened uh, every day during the summer. Uh, my house faces west, and so um, as soon as the sun starts going down, it would you know, get under my the sort of porch awning thing and, uh, yeah, directly... Direct sunlight would do it, and I went so far as to, like, I went on Reddit as well, and I was like, okay, how can I fix this? People were like, oh, put, like, a white vinyl on it to try to reflect some of the sunlight, and that seemed to, like, maybe make it work through some days where it would have not worked, uh, but it's still definitely shut down, so, uh, yeah, not I, that's, like, the biggest downside to me. I hope they, I don't know, come out with a better version, I'll probably get that, but... I agree that the um, like the HomeKit secure video stuff is great. Uh, going through recordings is great. Like I can see, like Dimitri said, if there's people I don't want to talk to, I just don't, and I get an immediate notification when I get a. Package Except when you're not home, then you then you respond to all of them as if you are home, which is like a cool superpower that I did not have. Before. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> oh yeah, and it's got a microphone and a speaker, so you can talk through it and stuff, and just be like, "Hey, go away" or, or whatever. So I'm not interested. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's super cool. It's yeah, I, this stuff with with Ring is just like so bad, dude. And my parents have a Ring doorbell, and I want them to replace it. So yeah, yeah. I I hope Logitech fixes the the overheating power thing in their in their next iteration of it uh because yeah. like it's it's kind of crummy i don't know what the solution is maybe we talk to linus and have him build us a heat a heat sink with lots of fins oh, water cooled. To attached to it <laughs> water cooled yeah. <laughs> doorbell water cool uh, let's water cool my doorbell yeah he water cooled his house yeah. what's next um exactly uh like all king aside his videos are pretty pretty entertaining to watch uh despite They're the so screaming dude. um but yeah, uh, I my my next guess, and this is very much a solution that my dad would have thought of more than me. Uh, but there exists at Home Depot some aluminum tape, and it's actual like very oh. thin sheets of aluminum with tape. Yeah. Um, and they reflect very well. Great for insulation is... and stuff like that. Um, so that might also work in terms of reflecting yeah. all sun. Uh, away from the thing, that though would, it might reflect it would be so heat ugly, back in. dude. <laughs> it would. Yeah. Oh, it would. It would act as a mirror. You can you can allow people yeah. to check themselves out as they're checking you out. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure they look good for the camera. Saving that one for the titles. Um, <laughs> All right. So. Yeah, like I'm sure there there's some solution. Um, I don't know what it is. What sucks? Yeah, what sucks? I guess is an I awning think is the solution, or move your front door to the north. Yeah, I'll just move the front door. That sounds, seems reasonable. <laughs> what sucks is like this was I, when I bought the doorbell. I don't know about now, but it was like the only doorbell that supported HomeKit Secure Video, and that's why I got it. So it doesn't really still? seem like they're. <laughs> Probably like it doesn't seem like there are any alternatives, which sucks because like there are a fair amount of like HomeKit secure video cameras like that circle view camera and everything that it's not a doorbell. But like as far as doorbells go, there's like nothing, no alternative. So, you know, you're stuck with this overheating problem if you live anywhere with any amount of heat and direct sunlight like we both do. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if you're in Alaska, you're probably good. So that's sweet. Yeah. Though maybe not, because sun beating down can heat things up, especially if they're black. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, so. Um, this has been the episode of Rants. Yes, indeed. Um. As always, I want to personally thank everyone for listening in this week. Please be sure to follow us on Mastodon.social at Code Completion to know when new episodes go live and feel free to toot at us if there's ever a topic you'd like for us to dig into. Most importantly, as a small podcast, please be sure to share this with your friends and family who are also interested in any part of the process of app development. It's your support that enables us to continue doing this, and we hope to grow a healthy community around everything we discuss. Once again, I want to give my thanks to Spencer, who is at Spencer C. Curtis, that's S-P-E-N-C-E-R-C-C-U-R-T-I-S, for joining me this week. My name, once again, is Dimitri. You can find me at Dimitri Buñol, that's D-I-M-I-T-R-I-B-O-U-N-I-O-L, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.